in the beginning, it felt okay, like a good idea. The sun was shining, it was warm, the performer felt different, he changed, he wanted to be outside. He didn't have that much to do and probably he would need the money. But maybe he should have just splashed around a bit or just gone swimming. He definitely should have known better. Like the kids that start playing around in the pool and end up running around the edge and throwing each other in the water until they get a house for board. Later, he would realize you have to take control of a situation before it gets out of hand and someone gets hurt. Because even though water is beautiful in the way it dances with light and makes you feel weightless, it's also deadly. At his first recruitment session, he was tested by a person in their 20s with long, straight, blonde hair tied symmetrically into a ponytail. They wore a polo shirt with the company logo. They held a clipboard. Without smiling, they asked him to swim 50 meters. When he got out of the pool and was still dripping, they asked him what he would do in an emergency. He said he would call the emergency number and tell them what happened. What else? They asked. What else would you tell them? He went blank. They stared at each other. Wo du bist, they said. Du musst sagen, wo du bist. With that, they thanked him and said, wir sind jetzt fertig. He walked back to his towel at the end of the pool and watched as other applicants got to swim a lap underwater, pull dummies alongside themselves through the water, deep dive for five kilogram rings, all tasks he could have easily accomplished had he been given the chance. He couldn't believe that such a simple task of calling emergency and telling them where he was could mean the difference between success and failure. Such a detail and I'm such a good swimmer, he thought. A little acceptance might have done him well, though. He could have walked away. He could have knocked on the door of his old friend who lived nearby the pool. They could have drank coffee together and laughed about his mistake and agreed it's probably all for the best. But he knew that particular old friend hated uninvited guests. So he stayed at the pool and decided to ask for feedback. Whenever you fail at an application, his mother had taught him, you have to ask for feedback, no matter how painful. So he walked up to the person who seemed to be in charge of the process. He said, Ich weiß nicht wegen mein Deutsch, ob ich gut verstanden habe, aber wahrscheinlich war ich unerfolgreich, oder? They said his German seemed fine, but that you had to know what to say when you called emergency if you want to be a lifeguard. Aber wenn Sie noch mal versuchen wollen, können Sie nächste Woche wiederkommen. So he did. It was at a different pool the second time and in a different corner of the city. At first, he didn't register at the little table with the sign declaring we're hiring, but instead sat at the top of the tribuna next to the pool and watched as young athletic bodies gathered in a group, each holding a little card. He looked at their bodies and wondered what he was doing there. He was not intimidated by their swimming, but by their shiny, muscular youth. These are not my people, he thought. These are the people I went to school with. I had nothing in common with them and wanted to get as far away from them as possible. So why am I here with them standing again by the side of a pool? He almost didn't go down the stairs, but then he reasoned with himself, this is not about you. You are not the subject. It's not your story. You just have to find out how it goes in order to tell it. So stop thinking it's all about you and get to work. No one here knows who you are. You don't exist. You're a lie, so play along. Think of it as a role. And so he forgot himself, buried his doubts in a shallow grave, and went down to collect his card. In the next group, beside him was an elderly man who swam very slowly, and some other swimmers, some even in their 30s. When the time came, they were asked to swim 50 meters. Aber ohne Schwimmbrille, added the red-haired person now holding their cards. At the end of the pool, 
they were met by a dark-haired person with an accent. They smiled and laughed and spoke loudly. He relaxed. Next, they had to each jump from three meters. He waited at the base of the tower until it was his turn to climb up. From where he stood, though, he couldn't see from which level the others had already jumped. So when it was his turn, he accidentally climbed up too many flights of stairs and jumped from seven and a half meters instead of three without hesitating. He didn't realize until he was out of the water and the loud person in charge seemed really excited and congratulated him. This shocked him, but he realized that it might work in his favor. After that, they each dived for a ring at four and a half meters depth, and that was that. You'll hear back in a week, the person told them. So keep training in case you get selected for the next level. They didn't even ask me about the emergency call he thought as he went home. The performer had been swimming in Germany for some years now. He started swimming again seriously when he was working in an acting ensemble in Munich. It helped him deal with his job because there was some controversy that the performer should even be allowed to work in an acting ensemble in Munich. Because the performer was not only a performer and not an actor, but also the performer was a performer in the place of an actor. And inside the ensemble, the performer was supposed to perform, not act. And this was naturally interpreted as a threat and a criticism of the actors and their acting. And at the same time, by working in an actor's ensemble as a performer in place of an actor, well, the performer started quickly to no longer feel like a performer. And some people said, you're actually a good actor, or your acting is really improving. <laughs> and then he wondered what that was doing to his performing. But then actors would say, you're a great performer, and he would smile and wonder exactly what they meant. <laughs> and of course, even being a performer in an acting ensemble was interpreted by some as a complete betrayal of the other performers, but also of the place where performers come from, the free scene. And it had taken the performer some time to even work out what a performer was, because he stupidly had thought that performer in German was the same as performer in English. But it's not. It's an English word used in German, but with a different meaning, like handy. So the performer was confused. Anyways, as he swam one day, he remembered a conversation he had had with his mother when he was 12 years old. This conversation now seemed like something of an omen. You see, the performer as a child had wanted to be an actor, but he had started singing lessons and thought, perhaps I'm a singer. So he said it to his mother that I think I want to be a performer. She replied, I thought you wanted to be an actor. He said, well, I want to be on the stage, either singing or acting. She said, yeah, but performer sounds a bit strange, like you could be in the circus or a stripper or something. <laughs> he said, okay, um, I don't think anyone is going to think I'm in a circus or that I'm a stripper, but what's wrong with that anyway? His mother was a teacher, by the way. A big shout out to all people here who work in the circus or who are strippers or who are teachers. The performers and the actors, you know who you are. In English, a performer is a broad definition for someone who does something, performs, for an audience, a body that puts itself on some kind of stage. In English, you could say an actor is a kind of performer, although, as you heard, his mother was skeptical. You could say the actors and the other performers, about, for instance, the actors and the singers, and the dancers. This and the other performers implies the actors are also performers. In Germany, if you are a Schauspieler, an actor, you are not a performer, and vice versa. So very briefly, actors evolve from the dramatic tradition of already written plays by authors directed by directors in which they play characters inside fictional narratives and do not play themselves under any circumstances, 
but rather transform into these characters or roles or figures. Whereas performers come out of what in Germany is called the post-dramatic tradition of performers making their own work, inventing their own forms, texts, structures, collaborations, often with the real non-fictional world in which for political and aesthetic reasons they go on stage as themselves. Oh, and actors generally work in the Stadttheater in productions produced and financed by the institutions, and performers work in the free scene and finance the productions themselves, usually via writing applications for public funding and often with small contributions by the institutions that show their works. So sometimes Actors think that performers are boring, ugly neoliberals selling their own identities for not much money. And sometimes actors, performers think that actors are spoilt brats who care more about their fame and vanity than their politics. And at other times everyone gets along, <laughs> if they ever meet, because often they stay in their separate scenes and institutions and theatres. But at this time, the performer was involved in an experiment in which the free scene and the Stadttheater could coexist together, and it would turn out to be both a wonderful success and a complete failure. But while it was happening, at times the performer wondered if in the end the only reason he wasn't an actor was because he wasn't a German actor and could never believably play a German, or for that matter, a Bavarian, because of his accent and his language skills. And as a result, he would also never get an agent or be on German television. But he felt he had betrayed other performers by agreeing only to perform in other people's work in the Stadttheater. But for that, he got paid every day, even between productions and on holiday. He easily found an apartment, even in Munich, and he eventually got a permanent German residency permit. But when he read in the newspaper, Eine hochkarätige Sprech- und Schauspielkunst ist nicht mehr, nicht mehr gefragt. Das interdisziplinäre, partizipative, postdramatische Diskurs- und Performance-Theater das der Intendant nun mit schier ideologischer Vehemenz etabliert, will nicht den Schauspielvirtuosen, sondern den Performer. Nicht eine Rolle, sondern sich selbst soll er verkörpern, soll Repräsentant sein eines, eigenes Lebensgefühl 4.0. Das So bin ich ist in diesem Theater das Neue als ob. When he read that, he knew he was the performer. And when he looked at the audience, he knew they knew he was the performer. And as he got used to the deliberately placing of their coughs, the perfectly timed clearing of their throats, the fine arching of their frowns and their sighs, and those quick looks away when he dared to look in their eyes, he decided to use it. Use the state you're in, was the quote of his favorite teacher when he was back where he came from and a student at, ironically, an acting school. <laughs> the swimming started after some famous actors decided to leave the acting ensemble with performers, after he was booed for his role in a Chekhov play, and after a friendly dresser knocked on his dressing room door one day to make an appointment to go upstairs to change his costumes, weil du ein bisschen zugenommen hast. The first thing he had done when he realized his body also belonged to the theater now was shave his head. I'm institutionalized, he thought. If I have to have hair, they can give me a wig. Then on the day before his premiere, he lost his voice. Well, that's that, he thought. But when the director of the Kunstlerische Betriebsbüro, who now controlled his life, his weekends, and his appointments, and whom he had to ask permission if he wanted to leave the city, well, this director miraculously arranged an appointment for him on a Sunday morning with a renowned ear, nose and throat doctor who smiled flirtatiously as he injected cortisone into his arm and said, opera singers are addicted to this shit. Within a few hours, his voice was better than ever and the production was a success. Now, he was rehearsing a new production 
in which he had to wear a full body suit that extended over his hands and feet. Over his head, there was a thick, spongy mask with a slit going up the back so that after he squeezed it over his head and onto his face and adjusted the holes onto his mouth, nose and eyes, the mask could be pulled tight with Velcro straps along the back of his neck and head so that he could only see directly in front of him through the crisscross of gauze over the holes for his eyes. Sometimes, due to the lack of oxygen and the minimal silent choreographies they performed, he would find himself falling asleep and wonder if ev anyone had just seen his head drop. <laughs> Breathe, he thought, but I feel like I'm drowning in here. So he went swimming at Dante Bart, and being underwater was the perfect way to adjust to the claustrophobia of his costume and of being a performer in an acting ensemble. Dante Bard wasn't the closest pool, but he hated to swim in less than 50 meters because all the turning made him dizzy. Plus, the closer pool was a Hallenbad. Dante was a 50 meter outdoor pool that was even open in winter, only in Munich. It was more expensive, but he was a performer in an acting ensemble now. And so in his breaks after rehearsing in all that costume, but before the evening performances, if he had one, he would watch the steam rise up off the pool as the snow fell down onto the water. It was a sight he had never witnessed before. This really is Dante's part, he thought. His preferred stroke was freestyle. He didn't like breaststroke because of how it made his knees feel, and he didn't like the sound of going in and out of the water. Backstroke was disorientating, butterfly way too dominant and completely exhausting. No, he liked freestyle. He liked to be face down in the water, looking at the bottom or watching the swimmers around him, listening to the water go past, stretching one arm out in front and then the other, breathing every third stroke on alternating sides, gliding towards the wall and leaving his arms by his side as he flipped over his legs and pushed off again. Deep stretch, kick, lap after lap after lap. With his head underwater in an outdoor pool, he felt he could be anywhere. He could even forget he was a performer and swimming outside in the pool. Once he forgot he was on the wrong side of the lane, he was back where he came from. But he was often jolted back and not just because of the snow. He could never understand why in a 50 metre swimming pool, there were only about two or three lanes that had ropes. He would slowly have to come to terms with this new division, sports swimmers and other people swimming. The sports swimmers were confined to a few lanes. The other people swimming, usually about the same number, were all spread out over the rest of the pool with no lanes, mostly doing breaststroke in changing directions. In the pools where he had come from, all the lanes were roped and there was only sport swimming with divisions of fast, middle and slow speed. But here, even in the so-called sport swimming lanes, there were always people doing breaststroke incredibly slowly, <laughs> seemingly unaware of how slowly they were swimming. Do they think they are sport swimmers? He thought to himself with a mixture of awe, disgust and some pity. <laughs> Maybe they don't know they're in the fast lane, but often he had the feeling they knew exactly where they were, but they just didn't care. Or they don't believe in fast lanes. Or they think fast is relative. Or there are much more important things to worry about. You see, swimming made him ugly, he realized. Swimming made him aggressive. Apparently, swimming is for narcissists, the first of whom fell in love with his own water reflection after all. You can only do it alone, and you, don't, you can't speak to anyone, at least when you're doing freestyle. The performer had tried swimming in Berlin before Munich, but had given up, disgusted with the other swimmers, but also with himself. There was a 50 meter pool, the sport pool, with a few lanes, the rest unlaned. Then also a pool for playing with a slide. And another pool without any lanes at all. So many people swimming. So many pools. So little lanes. You would think with all the other pools, they would just lane the entire sport pool. But not in Germany. And of course, 
Because they're so few, the sport lanes got really full. He realized even in poor shape, he was a fast swimmer here. He could either, either swim slowly stuck behind someone or overtake. Perhaps being fast was something he could only embrace later when he was a non-German performer in a Munich acting ensemble. So he began to perfect the art of weaving around swimmers. He embraced himself as a virtuosic German swimmer in a way he could never be a virtuosic German actor. He tried to wait for the best moment. He stayed as close to the middle as possible without touching the person he was overtaking. He stayed smooth and elegant and tried not to race or splash or kick aggressively and he over overtook in the most calm, conscious way possible. But it wasn't easy. He discovered that all too often some people, especially men, when they realize they're being overtaken, they speed up. <laughs> he never remembered this from where he came from because it was clear that if someone was overtaking you, they're faster than you. It's not personal. If you're being overtaken and you speed up, then you put the person overtaking you in danger of a collision because if someone is also overtaking on the other side, there's no room. So it's more social to just let them pass, but not here. So he learned if someone was overtaking on the other side, he had to dive down, swim under the oncoming swimmer and continue overtaking. And so he prepared himself whenever he overtook that it may turn into a kind of mini race, which included a duck dive. And sometimes this would go on for half a lap, but in the end, the other swimmer would get tired because they're suddenly going much faster and they get exhausted. The first thing he learnt when he started swimming was, don't race with anyone else but yourself. I guess that is kind of neoliberal, he thought. One day in Berlin, when the lanes were quite full, including someone doing breaststroke really slowly, someone seemingly unaware that they were swimming in the middle of the lane, making overtaking an almost impossible, or only if you go on the outside of them, then placing them in danger of collision, and a group of three swimmers who stopped and talked at the end of each lap, spread out across the wall. If you share a lane with other people who are doing laps, which of course includes turns, well, where he came from, if you block the wall from others who are turning, it's a no-go. On this day, he decided out of desperation to try and swim in the other part of the pool without lanes. He knew it wouldn't go well, but he tried anyway. In the other part of the pool, there was only one word to describe it, chaos. People swimming up and down, some in a straight line, but some across, some diagonal, mostly breaststroke, but some doing backstroke with no orientation because there are no lanes. Others doing that double arm backstroke that he had never really seen before he came to Germany. Some swimmers sticking to their path and not changing direction to the point that if you swim in their path, it becomes like a game of chicken, as well as some kids jumping around and playing. So he went back to the lane, and then a woman yelled at him, Warum schwimmen Sie so schnell? And he didn't know what to say. He thought about saying sorry, but then he said, Weil ich so schwimme, and kept swimming. But he had to ask himself, should he swim slower? Why was it bad to swim fast? Why should someone not want someone else to swim fast? Why would someone want to hold someone else back? Should he swim slower for the others? Should he as a male swim slower? Was he being toxic with his need to swim fast? Was it a privilege that he swims fast that he maybe needs to check? And when he got out of the pool and a guy approached him admiringly and says, Du kannst wirklich Gas geben? He just shrugged and walked away. Not long after that, he gave up in Berlin, but now in Munich, suffocating under his costume, tired of thinking about actors and performers, he started swimming again. And as he thought of the smug, frowning bourgeois faces that he performed for each night, 
Wondering which of them would boo him next, he thought, go ahead, I don't care, I'm a fast swimmer. And indeed, whether or not his acting or performing was improving, his swimming certainly was. And although at times he resented the audience, he often had fun with his colleagues from all the departments, even the actors. Where he came from, places like this, with all kinds of differently skilled workers employed together by a theatre, getting paid on holidays and when they're sick, represented by unions in a theatre, such places didn't exist. In the spirit of neoliberal economics, most tasks like the building and painting of sets, the sewing of costumes, the doing of makeup are outsourced. Most people, including technicians and actors, work as freelancers for the length of one produc production. Repertory theatre doesn't exist anymore. Commercial theatre made for profit dominates. This was political, but to be part of this, even as a performer, he had to accept the chaos of a German swimming pool. Somehow all of the cultural cliches go out the window when people in Germany share space in water. And then one day, as he swam, he found himself rethinking history and the Second World War and wondering how it would be different if the Germans had behaved on land as they do in the water. And then he realized he's getting a bit fucked up. <laughs> so, um, here is a ein, ein kleiner Wörterbuch. Um, these are some words that you have to learn if you want to become a lifeguard. You have to do a little theory test. Um, would anyone like to ask about one of them? <laughs> Which? Parketsprung. That's like a, um, a bomb dive. So um, you have to know the different dives and, and jumps. Um, because you have to eventually control the spring to them, um, but also because you have to know, for instance, how to um, go into Unbekanntes Gewässer. So you wouldn't want to do a Körpersprung into a Unbekanntes Gewässer because that might really hurt you. Um, I'm going to tell you where is it? Um, the first and maybe the most important thing when you're going to be a lifeguard is Eigensicherung. Because basically when you're in water, if you're going to help someone who's in trouble, many times they will get into a state of panic. And in this state of panic, this is actually the worst thing you can do if you're ever in trouble in water even if you're being taken out into the depths of the ocean, the worst thing you can do is fight or panic. The best thing you can do is to conserve your energy, stay calm and lie on your back and let the water take you out to sea and maybe try and signal that you need help because fighting gets you into this panic zustand and that's when you're um, going most at risk of drowning. So when you're going to rescue someone who's in trouble in water, the most important thing is that um, you recognize that they could be in this state. And wh when they're in this state, it's not personal. They will um, instinctively try to hold you to keep them afloat and in so doing, push you underneath the water. So um, Eigensicherung means that you use whatever you can to keep as much distance between you and the person who's in trouble um, so that they cannot get into physical contact with you. Um, and that's what... Uh, would someone like to be rescued? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Oh, my God. Okay, so maybe... Um, Maybe can you like, um, oh no, okay, no, no, let's not, okay, you're not passed out, but you're like having trouble, so, yeah, 
maybe a, a bit even. Yeah. Yeah, you can't hold on to that because that's not there, but yeah. Um, so then I, I, I'm not going to go up to him like this because he, he's instinctively going to go like this. And I'm going to show you what I do if it gets to that. But if it gets to that, I have fucked up in a bad way. What I need to do is to give you this and say, it's all good. I'm here. Look at me. Look at me. And then I'm going to swim and he's going to come with me. Oh. I don't know if you're he, but anyway. Um, and, and then, uh, 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 otherwise, if you do this, okay, we'll do this slowly, and it's a little intense. You, then you have to learn about how to get out of this situation. So I'm going to go like this, and like this, and like this. It's all underwater, and I'm going to go like this. And now I have you with an arm lock. Is, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> And you can't like do anything to me, and I can take you using a um, what's that word? Schwunggretcher um, to to get to the shore. Thank you so much. Round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> that is called a Fesselschlepp griff. Um, any other questions before we move on? Schwunggretcher is like a breaststroke kick. And that's what you have to learn how to do. Um, if you rescue someone, you can't swim using your arms because you might be holding on to someone. The only thing you can do is use a breaststroke kick because they might be here on top of you. Schwunggretcher. Handballen, that's what you use when you're giving someone um, a heart massage or doing um, a resuscitation. We can do that as well now if you want, but... Oh, you do want? <laughs> yeah, very good. You ha I would have to take off your shirt. No, it's okay. We don't have to. Um, and, um, but, yeah, that's all part of the next thing, which is the ultimate performance of a lifeguard. This is a performance they give for the DLRG, the Deutsche Lebensrettungsgesellschaft. And these are all the, the scenes of their performance. <laughs> um, they have to swim with the different strokes. Then they have to swim in clothes, which I never really understand. Because, I mean, if you're going to swim 300 meters in clothes, it would be quicker to take the few seconds it takes to take off your clothes and then swim the 300 meters. Nonetheless, you have to do it. And then at the end, you have to take off the clothes in the water and throw them onto the edge. Um, there's, a, there's a jump from three meters. Probably the most feared is the 25 meter Streckentauchen because you have to swim underwater for 25 meters. Your legs can't touch the surface has to be all underwater. And there is the danger of like a Schwimmbad blackout or a, um, hyperventilation. So if you are swimming underwater or diving and you start to hyperventilate or panic, then you can pass out. Um, uh, then you have three times deep diving, which turned out to be my least favorite activity. Um, you have 50 meter transport swim, like where you're swimming with someone or moving them. Um, doing the different choreographies that help you get out of a situation where someone is like trapping you, sorry. Um, then schleppen with Kleidung. Also the Kleidung, when you do it in the test, it's already wet. You have to put it on, it's disgusting. Um, the, the Ausrüstung equipment that you need to use. And then this is like the ultimate, where you have to put it all together, like a decathlon of like Leben Rettung, um, which it at the end includes a Herzlung Wiederbelebung. Um, okay, okay, I'll go on. Any questions? No, you don't have to swim with shoes. 
which I'm sure, I don't know why they let you not swim with shoes, because if you can't take off your clothes, then why would you would have to take off, yeah, anyway. Okay, I'll stand here. When he got there on time at 8 a.m., the sun was shining, it was already hot. He had to take off all his jewelry and a big berry guy in the change room helped him with his second earring when it got stuck. <laughs> they all, 22 of them, stood around in their swimmers, got split into groups. One of his first thoughts was, it's somehow cute to watch presumably straight sporty guys schlepping each other. Practicing all those befilings griff up choreographies by the side of the pool in your swimmers could have been a bit awkward, but no one said anything. There's no way I could have stood around like this with all these men in swimmers when I was younger. It would have been like a nightmare, he thought. Some people had accents, most people were German, most were white, most were male, probably most were straight or all. Everyone could swim, they all seemed cis. The second week, almost half didn't turn up and only males were left. The most dramatic task was the 25 meter underwater swim. People from weeks before came back for another turn. Everyone who turned up passed the test in the end. He realized nothing could ever prepare him for the moment when he actually might have to rescue someone. But the most important thing to remember when saving someone else was to protect yourself. At the end, they did role plays. The performer had to pretend to be a guy playing with his friend who gets too violent. He was put in a Fesselschlepp grip and was screaming, wir spielen nur, wir spielen nur, es war nur ein Spaß. And the performer looked at his audience standing along the back and runs, but they just looked bored. Also in the second week, they had to redo the rings test. And he didn't plan on that because he thought the big practical things were over and his friend from Munich, another performer, was visiting and they had smoked a lot of cigarettes and other things. Th this was the only moment he thought maybe he won't make it. His lungs screamed after the second dive and he had to take a moment. He also forgot to equalize the pressure in his ears. But he managed okay. When you deep dive, you have to equalize the pressure in your ears. That means like four meters or something. A guy he had sex with at a chill told him he was positive for some STIs, so he booked an appointment with the doctor. But on the morning of his appointment, his ear suddenly closes from inside and he can barely hear on one side, as if it's blocked or muffled. The doctor tests him for the other things and listens to his cough and looks in his ear and prescribes antibiotics, a nose spray, and a trip to the high and all. Again, when he gets home, he begins to shiver more than he has ever shivered before. He begins to sweat. His ear hurts. He wants to go back to where he came from. Four billion years ago, single cell organisms. It takes the single cells 500 million years to grow hairs, which they use to push and pull the liquid. They can swim. Everything swims. Worms, jellyfish, then fish. Our ears used to be gills. The fluid in our ears used to be the fluids along our spines that kept us upright when we swam. Human embryos look like fish embryos. A newborn has a primitive reflex that closes the windpipe if they are submerged. Veins constrict, heart rate drops, blood is redirected to the organs to conserve oxygen. The spleen releases red blood cells. Tick to lick, tick to lick, walk out of the water. The rainbow serpent crawls across the land, making rivers. Leave the water. Reptiles, mammals could swim. Elephants can swim, but the primates and the great apes, they have trouble. The impulse of the human baby becomes weaker as they age. Not though in the summer Bajau people of Southeast Asia who dive up to five hours a day and keep the reflex and have spleens 50% bigger than their neighbors on land. Humans have to learn to swim. The summer Bajau start very young. He looks at his pillow and it's covered in red and yellow. My ear is bleeding, he thinks. One side feels like it's underwater. When he goes to the toilet, he bumps into things and thinks voices from the living room are coming out of the bathroom. Some Samar Bajau people intentionally burst their eardrums when they are young. 
They bleed from the ears and the nose and spend a week lying down, but after that they can dive without pain. If you want to know if he swam so, it's in his ears. That's where it is. He reads it in a book that most likely the Neanderthals in Italy swam. They look at remains from 100,000 years ago and think they were diving three or four meters down into the bottom of the bay. The reason they know that, the Neanderthals could swim, is because it's in their ears. That's where it is, in the remains of their ears. They got swimmers' ears. Bonnie Tsui writes in Why We Swim of a study by Hirofumi Tanaka on the legendary female free divers of Japan and Korea, known as Ama, who have been diving for shellfish for 2,000 years. They start at 13 or 14 years old, and at the age of 65, their vascular function is sky high compared to other 65-year-olds, with significantly lower heart rates, less arterial stiffness, but they suffer from much greater hearing loss. He doesn't like going outside, so he stays in bed reading The Swimmers by Julie Otsuka, Swimming Studies by Leanne Shapton, Turning by Jessica J. Lee, Small Bodies of Water by Nin Mingya Powells, Swimming in the Dark by Thomas Zadrowski, Swainswansig Barnen by Karolina Val, The Chronology of Water by Lydia Yuknovich. When he goes to the ear, nose, and throat doctor, they test his hearing in a small room. When he hears a peep, he has to press a button. The doctor doesn't smile, but looks him in the eye. There is some hearing loss on your left side, he says. They give him cortisone again, <laughs> but in pills this time, and tell him to come back. Is there anything else I can do, he asks. Don't go swimming, answers the doctor. Almost all Western histories of swimming begin in the Sahara Desert, one of the driest places on earth. At Tassili Niger, in southern Algeria, there are paintings from 9000 BCE of swimmers on cliff walls. At Wadi Sura, there is the Gilf Kabir Plateau, the Great Barrier, 300 meters above the desert. Its artwork were known to Bedouin nomads for centuries, but in 1933, after Hungarian explorer Laszlo Almasi found one particular cave with its 8,000 BCE-year-old pictographs of figures caught presumably while swimming, one cave famously became known as the Cave of Swimmers. If you know it, maybe it's because you've seen the movie The English Patient. The Sahara was green, then it was desert. Then 12,000 years ago, the Earth wobbled on its axis, and for a few thousand years, the Sahara was green again. The performer still couldn't hear so well when he got the call, so he had to put the phone to his right ear and agreed to come in and sign the contract. He would start at 6 a.m. on the weekend, but there would only be a kid's pool open. Not so deep, so he thought he might not have to go swimming too much. If I need to rescue someone, though, I'll be ready, no matter what it does to my ears. He rose at 4.30 a.m., showered, had breakfast, packed his lunch, two sandwiches with Vegemite and cheese. Then he went down with his bag, got his bike, and rode to the nearest Uban station, traveled, got back on his bike, and rode up the hill at dawn towards the pool. He was the first one there, or so he thought. He realized that he was 
standing directly between the sun and the sign of the pool. The cemetery was disturbing and he wondered how long he would stand there alone before he turned his back to the And then it happened. He walked through the gate because it was open and because he worked there now. He's a lifeguard and he made a promise to himself. the pools where you have to wash your feet. Some people call them Fussbecken, but in the business they're called Durchreiterbecken. And that's the first word he had to learn. As the water filled up, he watched his colleague with the little bottles of chemicals testing the water. And it strangely reminded him of his father when he was a teenager doing the chemicals of their backyard pool. And also the pole with the net to fish the leaves out of the water. His father had been dead 10 years, but suddenly he was there again with him by the pool. And as he tried to fish the leaves out, a colleague told him to do it with feeling. He watched the nets and it reminded him of a jellyfish. And then he was back as a small child surrounded by jellyfish and crocodiles. And the only water where he could swim was, when, was a small water hole where there was a rope to swing off tied to a tree and there were leeches and he remembered women picking leeches out of his toenails with matchsticks and later he would have nightmares of a saltwater crocodile in a swimming pool. Jesus, it's not even 7 a.m., he thought. After the Durschreiter beckon were full, he was given a radio. Over the radio, a voice from the casa asked if it was okay to open and then he saw them. A line of people, some with towels around their necks and caps on their heads, marching towards him. They walked through the Durschreiterbecken he had just filled. He was shown where to sit 
and told they are the Frühschwimmerinnen. They come every day and he was given a cushion to sit on. He counted 21 swimming by 7, 10 a.m. They were mostly well over 60. Some of them seemed happy, one of them ecstatic. Someone asked the temperature. Someone dipped their toe in the water and looked up at the performer disapprovingly. He realized if it was cold, it was kind of his fault now. They seemed to love to swim. Maybe they are so calm because they don't have to work, he thought. He would come to recognize them, their faces, their strokes, their moods, or if they wore a different bathing suit. Mostly they swam the breaststroke with their heads out of the water and kept their hair dry. Some of them would have little conversations as they went past each other. On one side there was a 25 meter pool, but only two lanes were roped. The rest was free. I wonder if I will ever be that old, the performer asked himself. Within the first hour, some Sportschwimmerinnen usually came and did freestyle. They were a bit younger and much less happy. But by 8 a.m., most of the Frühschwimmerinnen were gone. As quickly as they arrived, they disappeared. And sometimes he wondered if they had ever been there at all. Once the pool was open and the Frühschwimmerinnen were in place, the watching began. There wasn't much else to do because anything else you did would stop you watching. So you had to learn to watch and nothing else and know that was enough. The first kids usually arrived later with, with parents. Kids without parents came a bit later still. But as long as there was someone in the pool, he had to watch. And once there were several people, watching got easier. But beyond a certain number, it became exhausting. The noise, but also he couldn't see the bottom of the pool. It all depended on the weather. On a hot sunny day, especially after it had already been hot the day before or the day before that, it would be full. The most effective way to keep concentration was to do a round, eine Runde machen. This involved walking around the edge of the pool. You could also do two rounds or seven. At first, he liked saying hello to people and smiling, especially in the mornings. Most people seemed to respond to this. Some looked away as he approached, and it gave him the feeling that he wasn't there. Some would start mini conversations. He would wait for the moment when they would register his accent or his mistakes. As the early shift wore on and the pool got more full, the atmosphere changed. Some of his colleagues, even much younger than him, became more serious, taller, when saying hello to people. It was a show of authority, he realized. It's important that people respect you, he was told. Otherwise, they think they can get away with anything. He knew this from theater audiences in Munich, of course. But as he walked around the pool, he had to confront his own desire to be open and welcoming with the advice that he shouldn't be too nice because that could lead to him being thought of as weak which could lead to things getting out of hand and people getting hurt. They liked some degree of authority, but not too much. And he realized that he was there to police as well as to care and didn't quite know how that should go together. Sometimes when his eyes met with other adults looking at him, he felt conscious of his uniform, which he wore like a costume. He sensed their skepticism or even their disgust he felt ashamed that he had become a representative of German authority. And then he felt ashamed for thinking that, for what it implied of his colleagues. He felt like he was watching himself watching. He told himself, this is not me. This is a character. This is a lie. But the more it went on, the less he believed himself. How could something be a lie if it could mean the difference between someone's real life or death? That's not a story, that's real. Rescuing someone is not a performance either. But this is a story, he told himself. This is a performance. This is not necessarily what happened. It's a narration, it's a lie. And he reassured himself to wear the costume, play the part and stop thinking and accept that every time he came to work, he would destroy the fantasy even though this was the fantasy. The pools were shallow because the big deep pools were being renovated. 
The most likely emergencies would be small children, injuries from playing, especially on the slide, and older people having health problems. But mostly, most likely, nothing would happen. But he could remember a few rules. No eating or drinking inside the pool area. Watch for food and drinks. Everyone, including babies, have to wear swimmers. Watch for nude swimmers. No smoking inside the pool area. Don't park your kinderwagen inside the pool area. Don't sit on the lane ropes. No jumping or diving. It's okay to sit and watch, but you should never stand with your back to the pool, like an actor with his back to the audience. One man swims around with his kid on his back like a whale. A toddler with long curly hair slowly entering the water when the pills fountain suddenly turns on, screams and leaves the pool area in shock. Dad's going down the slide, maximum age, eight years old. Two women off the visa doing aerobics and another woman watching on from a distance copying and waving. Why doesn't she just join them? Fathers and daughters, people's faces when they're in the shower. Some don't react at all to the cold water. Others twist their bodies into new forms. A family of four sunbaking together. A boy holding on with both hands as his mother drags him through the water. Teenage girls taking turns massaging each other's backs. New dads and their kids and their rings and their balls and their goggles and their hairy chests. Watching boredom rundermachen. When there are boys sitting on the ropes, by the time he gets there to tell them, they're gone. And there are girls sitting on the ropes instead. So he calls them over and they look at him blankly and he tells them not to sit on the ropes and they say sorry and he feels more comfortable disciplining boys than girls. He wants girls to break the rules and boys to obey them. But the final sentence he has to learn is if someone refused to do what he asked, he could say, auf die Visa. He then extended this to also having a warning sentence. Wenn du so weitermachst, dann schicke ich dir auf die Visa. He also noticed at first he said, Entschuldigung, aber eigentlich darf man hier nicht essen. But the more he worked, or the later it was in the shift, he just shook his head, looked at the person who was eating and said, Essen verboten. So he watched and watched and watched, and mostly he said hello, and sometimes he did not. After a few days, he realized that he only felt real at the pool. He liked himself as a novice lifeguard, and he started to not like himself as a performer. But of course, he couldn't be one without the other. When he left the pool, he was confronted by his stories and his lies. His ear was still not better, but a second hearing test had shown improvement. But the shift work, changing from early shifts to late shifts to early shifts, could be as exhausting as the theatre work. And he was actually working two jobs. He was a lifeguard and he was making a performance. Or he was an actor living the role of a lifeguard. Or he was a lifeguard and a, a performer being an actor preparing for a role that didn't exist inside a performance. The more he thought about it, the more confused he became. And he just wanted to be a lifeguard and not anything else. And he didn't know what to tell his colleagues because he didn't know what he was doing himself. So he told himself that he didn't have to tell them, but if he kept them out of the story, or he didn't have to tell them until he knew what he was going to say, or he didn't have to tell them because why should they care about a performance he would do in a little room for some people? He wondered if he had to keep it for himself in order to find out what it was. To keep the story pure, he couldn't be anything else at work than the lifeguard. But he imagined if people found out, ideas of narcissistic artists would be reinforced. Artists that watch and extract and then use for their own stories and profits and acclaim. Same old story. But he was actually working at the pool. He was actually doing his job. He was earning money for the tasks he did separately to making the performance in his own time. Did he also have to be honest about what he did outside? Maybe he wasn't working at the pool for the performance. Maybe he was doing the performance in order to work at the pool. If he needed to rescue someone, he would in a flash. Would he write about it though? Would he pretend he rescued someone? He wanted to experience the role of the lifeguard as a lifeguard, but he couldn't shake the feeling that he was just pretending and then it became clear to him. 
the reason he couldn't tell his colleagues was because not telling them was part of the story and he needed to stay inside the story like an actor staying inside the character. The morning of his 45th birthday, he went to work and got there on time. He was the first in the pool area and saw there was a body in the water at the other end near the lanes. He thought it was a joke. It was clearly a mitarbeiter because they were wearing the uniform, but they weren't moving. He couldn't recognize who it was. It seemed like a male, but they had long hair. He called out, alles gut? And the no answer made him run faster. He thought about the lessons to throw in a lifesaver and not endanger yourself. But clearly this body was unresponsive. It just floated. And as he got closer, he looked at the Nikes the body was wearing and was surprised to realize he was thinking, I really like his shoes. As he jumped in, he didn't have a radio yet because the pool wasn't open. He was alone and he pulled the body to himself and turned it over to realize the hair was just a wig. And as it came off the body's bald head, the performer realized he was looking into his own face, but his lips were blue and his eyes were staring off into the distance. And he could only think, who is rescuing who here? And then he heard a voice from the tower. Was zum Teufel machst du da? Bist du bescheuert? His colleague called out. And he was standing fully clothed in the water. And his other body was gone. And he found himself answering, looking at his empty hands. Yeah, irgendwie bin ich reingefallen. And he ran to get dry clothes so that he would back, be back in time for the Durchstreiter beckon to be full. That day, the pool was full. There were so many kids playing that the ropes were taken out and there were no lanes left for the Sportschwimmerinnen. Later, a Sportschwimmer asked if a lane could be put back in. The performer wants to do it, but is told by a colleague it won't work because the kids will constantly play in, in the lane. He remembers thinking, if I worked at a pool, then I would make sure that the Sportschwimmerinnen could do their laps. And so he puts the lane back in. But sure enough, the kids constantly play on the rope and play in the lane. The territory cannot be claimed back. The performer tells kids to stay out of the lane for a while, but then gives up. The sports swimmer complains, and the performer finds himself answering as his colleague had told him to do in the first place. Tut mir leid. Hier ist kein guter Ort für Sportschwimmen. Du brauchst einen Verein. The sun is out today and everyone is feeling gay. The Kasse Schlange is full. And soon you'll all be in the pool. <laughs> we won't let you go home early. Not till you've taken off dry clothes and slipped inside of the wet. All bodies welcome here, then you'll be set to face the world on dry land again. The beckon and the sprung beckon are reopened. The 50 meter pool is full. There are three lanes for Schwarzschwimmerinnen and he watches them. But even more, he watches the sprung beckon. He's told that here you don't say auf die Wiese, here you say house for board. Children and adults ask him, plead with him to open the tower. Kannst du bitte die Dreier aufmachen? Meister, Meister, wann machst du die Zähne auf? Entschuldigung, Herr Bademeister, aber wann wird der Bümpfe aufgemacht? Ich bin kein Bademeister, ich bin nur Rettungsschwimmer. When the performer is on the tower, 
he stands at the platform and makes sure only one person dives at a time. When the jumper below has swum away, he gives pep talks to the nervous ones who find themselves unable to make the last step or leap into the air. Don't look down, look straight ahead, keep your arms by your sides. The water will stop your fall. It's all in your head. And then he counts down from five. Du schaffst das. Sometimes this is enough. Sometimes the people below start screaming in encouragement. Sometimes they scream out in frustration that the jumper is holding up the line. Sometimes they jump. Sometimes they turn back. It happens to young kids, but also to adults. There's nothing wrong with turning back when realizing you are not ready, the performer thinks to himself. But sometimes he wonders if it's true. One hot afternoon, the performer is at the three-meter platform one day, and there's maybe like 40 people in the queue. He's tired of the questions about, Einer, dreier, fünfer, ich weiß nichts. He answers, bald, gleich, 15 Minuten, halbe Stunde. Keine Ahnung. A big muscular guy with a beard and tattoos is standing on the three-meter platform but not coming forward to jump. The performer notices him and tells him to jump, to jump the three meter or go back down the ladder. And suddenly, the man climbs over the closed sign up to the five meter level. The performer screams, Mach das nicht, mach das nicht, wenn du springst, kriegst du Hausverbot. And the man climbs up to the 10 meter and jumps. Another teenager immediately follows. And the performer screams after him again, Mach das nicht, mach das nicht, wenn du springst, kriegst du Hausverbot. And he jumps. The radio goes crazy. Warum springen die vom Zehner? The performer tells the colleagues on the other side he told them not to jump. The lifeguards call security. The performer closes the spring to him and runs down the ladder. The jumpers are escorted out of the pool. He yells at the queue of jumpers. Der Springturm ist jetzt zu, weil Leute ohne Erlaubnis gesprungen sind. Later, the performer realizes that watching that scene, he would probably have cheered on the heroes jumping against the rules and thought the lifeguard was an idiot. Later, a colleague tells him, Du hast so, so, so toll heute gearbeitet, die ganze Tag, und du machst es immer wirklich gut, aber es gibt ein Problem. Du bist einfach zu nett und die Leute wissen das. That night, the performer realizes that he's not going to rescue anyone. There are hot days, then it's cooler again, and then there are more hot days, and then it comes time for the performance. And it goes well enough. There's a few people there. They listen and laugh sometimes. They clap at the end and no one from the pool comes to watch. After the show, the performer has one week left on his contract as Saisonkraft, but the pool is closed for the summer, and so the last week is spent packing things away, emptying the pools and preparing the Freibad for its winter schlaf. On his last day, the performer is sent to take down the signs and ropes from the spring to him, and sweep it before it will be covered up. And so he finds himself standing alone at the 10 meter tower in the middle of the afternoon, looking below with a broom in his hand. The steel of the inside of the empty pool shines even brighter in the sun without the water. He starts sweeping the ground. It's like sandpaper so that people with wet feet don't slip it's hard to kneel on it when he's sweeping up the pile of dirt. And then suddenly the chief lifeguard, the movie star good looking one, tall one, who everyone likes, is standing there beside him. And he looks at him and the lifeguard says, Hello Damien, wie geht's? Good danke, the performer answers. Ich mache das schnell fertig. Lustig, du hast meinen Namen benutzt. Ja, aber so heißt du ja. Ja, und sag mal, 
wie war es eigentlich, a guy working at a pool to sein? The performer looks into the lifeguard's beautiful blue eyes and realized he has dropped the broom as he hears it hit the ground. Ja, es war cool eigentlich. Ich werde es irgendwie vermissen. Und was machst du jetzt? Ja, wahrscheinlich spiele ich in einem Musical an der Schaubühne. <laughs> ah, cool. Als Schauspieler? Ja, eigentlich bin ich Performer, aber ja. And then the lifeguard smiles and says, <laughs> Ich weiß. And starts walking towards him, picking up the broom that was lying on the ground, but holding it by the end with the brushes and pointing the handle at the performer. The performer is standing up now. Ich war mal Schauspieler, says the chief lifeguard. Echt? Ja, aber damit habe ich auch gehört. Intendanzwechsel, weißt du? Bin da rausgestiegen. Du kennst die Geschichte bestimmt. Ah, scheiße. Nee, es war eigentlich das Beste, was mir passieren könnte. Ich bin froh, wo ich jetzt bin. They stare at one another. Seit wann weißt du, dass ich Performer bin? Asked the performer. Ich habe dich am Anfang gegoogelt. Wir wussten alle schon fast die ganze Zeit, was du hier machst. And the chief lifeguard smiled and prodded the stick gently into the performer's stomach, causing him to take a step back towards the edge of the platform. There was still a meter or so to the edge. The performer froze. Deine Performance war uns egal, said the lifeguard. Aber weißt du, was ich wirklich nicht verstehe? Du hast nur einem Leben. In deinem Alter hast du vielleicht noch 30 Sommer, wenn du Glück hast. Was meinst du damit? Ja, warum verbrauchst du deine ganze Sommer mit zwei Jobs? And now the smile was gone and he prodded the performer again. It seemed like a good idea at the time. He answered, looking back behind him at the edge, getting closer. Wahrscheinlich, weil du keine Ahnung hast, wie zu leben. Mann, du arbeitest die ganze Zeit. The performer was starting to panic, sweat dripping from underneath his cap. I guess, answered the performer. Du wolltest immer von Szene springen, oder? Ja, aber das Becken ist leer. Ich will nicht sterben, the performer said half smiling. Bist du dir sicher? Das wird eine tolle Geschichte sein. Was meinst du damit? Ja, das wird bestimmt gut für deine Performance. Aber der Performance ist schon vorbei. Bitte kann ich runtergehen? Aber jemand wie du, solange du lebst, wird der Performance immer weitergehen. The performer laughed awkwardly. <laughs> Aber ich will, dass es aufhört, bitte. Wir haben dich nicht gefragt, hier zu kommen. Du hast das selbst gewählt. Fuck you. Du kannst einfach keinen Spaß haben, oder? But I have sex with men. Und das soll reichen. And with that, the chief lifeguard laughed and pushed the performer one last time. And the performer gasped as he went over the edge and wondered how best to fall, not with his feet first, arms by his sides, surely, but as he tried to move his body around in the air, he watched the level where the water would have been if the pool was full go past and knew it wouldn't matter how he landed. And for the last four and a half meters, he could only imagine the deep blue cool water that wasn't there swallowing him. I don't know why you didn't want to stay a while together, didn't want to do anything that might imply forever for.
for you. Whoa.